with some more of the uh, tributes to our founding pastor, Dr. Scudder, who went to be with the Lord. And we're all, you know, saddened, but we're also rejoicing. And as we think of all the impact that he had on our lives and we, we reminisce and we, we tell the stories, it brings joy to our hearts. It brings joy to our faces because it's a reminder of all that God has done and also a challenge to us of what are we doing in our lives that can impact others? And so I know you're going to enjoy tonight. Uh, we've got some of our uh, staff members and pastors who were not able to come the last time and also some longtime members of our church. But we're going to start this evening with a video from one of our sister churches, and we're going to hear from one of their pastors now. So I hope you enjoy this, and uh, let's rejoice in the Lord together. I know these are trying times, and I know there's a lot of unknowns, but we serve a God that is great and is greater than any of the things that are going on around us. And our founding pastor, Dr. Scudder, would say many, many times, you can't outsmart God. You can't catch God off guard. So let's take some time tonight and we'll rejoice in him. We'll look back and have some fun memories of Dr. Scudder and how he challenged us and blessed us in our lives. And we'll do that together as a church family. And then I hope that not only will we go forward into this week with, yeah, plenty of unknowns, but being reminded that God is good and God is in control. I'm Pastor Rod Holler of the Cape Baptist Church. Recently, we said goodbye to Dr. Scudder, but only for a time. He's walking the streets of gold, praising his Savior, as he taught us all to do. I met Dr. Scudder back in 1980. I came from Pennsylvania, and I was looking for a church. Now that I settled in Chicago area, and I was directed and advised, go to Quentin Road, give that a try. I did. That Sunday morning that I went to check it out, Dr. Scudder was wrapping up his study in the Gospel of John. And I'll never forget, he ended explaining John chapter 3, verse 16, the clarity of the Gospel. And I knew right then, that was the church for me. I met my wife soon thereafter, and we served at Quentin Road for many years, learning many things about the Bible, the Christian life. And in 2007, we were able to come down from Chicago to Cape Coral. And we began a church and we passed on many of the things that Dr. Scudder had taught us. Many people are in heaven because of that man and his determination to protect the clear gospel of salvation through faith in the shed blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. Let us continue on in his memory, giving that clear gospel. Well, tonight is going to be a fun night. We're going to talk together. We've done this a couple of other times, and um, I'm not going to mention who. Karen said that that seat was reserved for certain age categories, but someone here said that. It's really not on purpose, but um, we've had a great time just talking amongst ourselves, remembering the stories, remembering all of these amazing memories that we've had of our pastor and founding pastor. And so uh, Karen Vacco is here with me tonight, Pastor John Tanney and uh, his wife Kristen, Pastor Dave Rendy and Kim. And this is a uh, multi-generational uh, gathering as like all of them have been. But what I love about this one is, is that all of the memories that we've had, all those great things that we treasured about Dr. Scudder that I know that I personally have, um, I got to watch people that were just a little bit older than me, like you, uh, as I grew up. But then I got to watch young people who, in my mind, you guys are the young people, um, implementing those same truths and those same principles of how to serve the Lord and got to watch you guys, you know, do that. And so that's what I love about today and also uh, the other meetings is just seeing the different people, different generations, but yet the impact, the, the commonality, you know, is the same of, of what Dr. Scudder uh, meant to us. So Karen, I'll let you go first um, and, and share. And I know that um, Dr. Scudder had uh, such respect for you and, um, and your family. And I know that uh, you have served faithfully in this church. 
um, for so many years. I mentioned that the last time, the last session that we did, where as a young person watching people just serve faithfully, no matter what was needed, uh, that was always your attitude. And I know that Dr. Scudder appreciated that and, and loved that and teased you about plenty of things as he did all of us. So, so share uh, what you want to give tonight. You know, uh, 40 plus years, you have so many memories and there's um, so many things that you can talk about and focus on. And I was going through it in my mind and frankly, I had to shut my mind off and say, okay, where are we gonna go with this? Hmm. Um, but to me, um, the most important thing was he never let me play church. Hmm. And I think you know what I mean yeah, by that. Yeah. Um, and I was just, I had a really big smile on my face a couple of weeks ago when Pastor Jim said um, something to the, I'm going to paraphrase, but something to the effect of, I'm not going to pastor a church if they're not soul winners. Yeah. He's not going to let anybody not play church in, yeah. under his um, pastorship. So that was um, just part of this legacy. You know, I know I've said this before, but I do think it bears saying again, um, what is the legacy? What do you want? What do I want? You know, I'm of an age where what do I want my legacy to be? And I want my family to serve the Lord. Um, I want all of us to reach out and witness as much as we possibly can. Mm -hmm. And I want to um, encourage uh, young people. One of the things Linda said to me after the retirement um, going away gathering that mm -hmm. we had, was she said, you know, she said, you talked about young people serving the Lord. And so I'm gonna repeat that again, because I think it's important. Uh, when we came to this church, um, everybody was a young people. So, <laughs> How many years ago was that? Uh, over 40. Over 40. Yeah. And, yeah. Um, but my husband, Bob, was so impressed with the generation that was younger. The, you know, probably the age of my granddaughter right now. You know, that age group and especially um, the young men. I have said this before, but he was always focusing on you, Pastor Paul, and Jimmy, um, <laughs> and was so excited that there were young people serving the Lord, which, you know, was unusual then, and it's even more unusual right now yeah. in churches, but that's not something that we've had to face. We do have young people serving the Lord, and it yeah. is exciting, and, um, you know, I have my daughter, my son-in-law, the next generation, and then I have my grandchildren. Isn't that awesome? Awesome. I mean, I love it. What more could, what more could a pastor want? What yeah. more could a mother want than to see her, <clears throat> excuse me, children serving the Lord? So I'm so grateful for that, and yeah. I'm so grateful for his um, support. Um, you know, he was always there. He was always there so um, to lead and to uh, guide and to support, and so was Linda. So um, I'm so appreciative of that. Do you remember, you're, you're talking about um, the, the blessing of having children serving the Lord and, and all that. And before Dr. Scudder's children were adults, he was already talking about, um, so real church, right? He would say real, you want to talk about real blessings? Real blessings are when you see young people deciding to serve the Lord, to dedicate their lives to the Lord. And you guys, you know, all did that. But but it was so cool to see as his kids got older and then his grandkids, um, his face would light up when he would talk about that blessing of God. You know, serving the Lord, is it worth it, right? Bottom line, what's what's really the outcome, the reaping and the sowing, right? And he would always talk about the value of that blessing being the greatest, and, and you're expressing the same thing. Um, and but what I loved is that he would he would put that out there as a as a goal, as a benchmark. What, let's strive for that that our young people would serve. There was an expectation. I was just you know, say it was an expectation. Yeah, yeah. Um, and uh, and your your husband Bob, he was so gracious. I, I mean, we were laughing with Gary the other night about our best, our, our biggest fans for our basketball and volleyball teams. And, and I can picture Bob and Gary and Dr. Scudder and my dad. There's probably pictures. The, the veins popping out of their necks <laughs> as they're screaming so loud for us while we're 
playing terrible basketball version of basketball. Um, but again, and I, I was saying this to Gary and Terry, you guys embraced his vision and his leadership 100%. And, and we saw that. I saw that as, as, as a young person. I saw that, hey, these are people who are saying this is going to be for real. Um, and he had that impact, but I'm so grateful, Karen, that you, your husband, Bob, so many other people embraced it and invested in that for, for my sake. And now I'm watching, you know, my own grandkids, you know, uh, coming up in this church. It's, it's such a special blessing. I, I, you, you can take away a whole lot of other blessings and dividends, if you will, of serving Christ. That, that's a great one. That's right. It's a great one. Um, so Pastor John, you have been here your whole life, uh, pretty much all of your life. And, um, I think of some fun memories when I think of these four, Karen, um, with regards to Dr. Scudder and all of his teasing and, and various things. Um, oh, yeah. lots of stories. He's, <laughs> and it was fun to see. And I, I think they've, I was listening to, uh, Pastor Mark the other night and to listen to how, how the stories start. And then they they exist on their own for a while, and then they suddenly grow one day to like a different level. Yes. For years, I was the young man who came into the church, ran up to the pastor, and pulled his tie. Yes. And it was you know everybody thought that was hilarious, the little tiny boy. And I we're still not sure if it was me or my middle brother <laughs> Joe. It's forever or, in the record book. Or another unnamed blonde small child that yeah. could have no, been it's named. You. It's, it's probably you. me. But then, but then it went from the pulling of the tie to then I pulled his tie and I punched and him too. And you punched him in the stomach. Yes, yes. I punched him yes. too. Oh man! But that was just something that he always enjoyed telling. Yeah. And uh, he just had such a love of. He would find something about everybody to laugh about and enjoy. And I remember I was just thinking about all the memories, and I I had a chance to sit down with Karen and my parents and I put them on the spot and like, what was it like the first time that you talked to Dr. Scudder? You had that first, like, what are some pivotal memories? Yeah. And uh, he was there for a huge moment, obviously in your life, uh, Karen, when you lost your husband, but for my dad and me personally, I've told this story before, like my own testimony, I would not be I, I wouldn't be serving the Lord if it wasn't for the challenge that Dr. Scudder gave to my father in Germany to move his family back yeah. here and be a family phys- physician and serve in the church. And how are you going to raise your kids, Bob? What do you want your kids doing in the future? You know, and to really challenge him and the grace that he gave me, Dr. Scudder did. Um, and it's just a good reminder for me. He's always such an example to see the best in people, mm-hmm. to correct them, take the time to correct them, which he did to me several times because I needed it. Me, me, <laughs> you know? me too. Join but the then club. he was so good at correcting me, but then saying, but then after that it was done. And especially if you reacted like in a positive manner to appreciate it and to be willing to move on. Yeah. Um, but one of the memories that, that my wife and I uh, enjoy is just, he, he had just gone through his heart surgery. And it was a, that was a huge moment for our church and obviously for him, a huge uh, struggle. And then the, it was a shock to all of us. And all of a sudden, it's like, what's going to happen? And eight days later, he was on the stage performing our wedding. That was his That's first, right. his first like, thing that he did and we were backstage and he was explaining to me like the scar and (laughs) how he couldn't cough he could like at night he had to hold a pillow to his chest i'm like why are you here (laughs) let's take you back home you know he wouldn't have missed it he He wouldn't have missed it and he was no that was so special that was so special how weak his voice was oh it was just not that made me that That made made me me more emotional more than anything else but it was so. It was such a special. Service. I had to actually. Uh, I, I can't get in trouble. He's in heaven. So <laughs> I, I had to babysit him one time right after the surgery. I don't know why, but it was 
Linda needed to be here or whatever, so I was I went over and either made dinner or did something, and he had that that heart shaped pillow, you know, that they give you to when you cough or whatever, to, you know. And I don't know why he had the Three Stooges on. Oh no! And <laughs> he and, to laugh. A bad and he yeah, and he way. said that the Three Stooges never made him laugh. But then it was that one where it's like as they're cutting into the meat, someone under the table is stepping on the cat, oh, no. and he got so <laughs> tickled that I'm like, I'm gonna fail in my job. I, we're gonna lose him. And and so I'm like, we're gonna turn this off. And so then he would want me to turn it off, but then he's like, no, no, this is too good. Keep it on, you know. Um, but I forgot that. I totally forgot that he, he, he did that wedding eight days he, after. And his heart was always, obviously he wanted to do it, be a part, you know, for Karen, for my folks, for, for us, but for the lost people, he was all about the gospel and yeah. always went back to the gospel. Yeah. And that, that gospel, I remember it was just, I was standing at the base of the, the platform, listening to it and thinking about all our family and what a gift to every time you would have a guest or any time you would have family or any time you would have anybody come into this church, you knew they were going to hear the gospel. Oh, so true. Can, and can, yeah. are there other churches that can say that? Yeah. I don't think so. Not consistently. Yeah. You know, so that was so special. I, you would lose count if, if you tried to think of how many times you've heard a church member, no matter how long they've been here in this church, and it still goes on today with the attitude of, I could just get so-and-so in the door. They knew mm -hmm. that that family member was going to, or a friend or neighbor, whatever it was, were gonna, they were going to hear the gospel. They were going to hear it really good, really simple, really clear. And um, it, when you think of the generations of families that have been won to Christ simply by getting you know, a grandparent or an aunt or an uncle or whatever it is in to hear the gospel, and... You knew in talking to those people, that's all they cared. Get them in the room. Because from there, you know, Dr. Scudder and now Pastor Scudder Jr., they'll, they're going to give the gospel. Um, but you're right. That's what he, that's what he lived for. Um, and um, okay. you guys, go ahead. No, you go ahead. Do you, you remember when he would say things like, you know, this, this church isn't built on me or you know, when I'm gone or if I'm gone, right? When he would make those statements, right? And I thought about this yesterday. In those moments, we never had to face the reality of if he's gone or when he's gone, right? We never had to face it or test what he was saying was accurate, meaning this church isn't built on him. It will go on, right? And so it hit me yesterday. I thought, you know what? Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm going to miss him so much, but this church is going on. It's just like he said, because it's based on the word of God. It's based on Christ himself, you know? And um, all those years when he would say it, we, we never had to test it, thankfully, the, 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 the heart, you know, surgery and all that. But here we are, and uh, he has gone into heaven, and it's going on stronger, you know, than Well, ever. but I think one other thing you touched on it about him showing grace to people, <clears throat> but... And this is how you know the ministry, though it was led by him, it wasn't about making him great. Yeah, yeah. The, the whole goal was to get the gospel out and every ministry was about that. But the reason I say about showing grace is because as you look at the people that are in their current roles as they stand right now, that's not where they started. Right. Is yeah. pastor had a way of looking at somebody and saying, let's try them there. Let's try them there. When it quite frankly, made no earthly sense. <laughs> made no earthly sense. I mean, I, I can say that for myself. So forget anybody else. I'll just say it for myself. That's so true. But though. he so had a walls. way of looking at it, whereas a businessman might look and say, I'm going to look for, I don't know, whoever is equipped with the best degree or the best experience. And that wasn't him. It wasn't about that. Yeah. It was what is best for that person's life? Mm -hmm. What is the will of God for them? And if I can be used to guide that person of any age, he would do it. And that was, that was the new person that came in. Um, <laughs> we hear, I mean, your dad was a doctor, but someone else, your dad, it, it, it was hilarious. I'll, I'll take a slight <laughs> rabbit trail, but it was hilarious to see all the points of contact that would 
that were sitting on the stage that are sitting on the stage now and from the stories that we'll hear of this person led this person that led this person that led this person. Yeah. I'm thinking yeah. of like a Dave Kimura, mm -hmm. somebody like that who your dad knew and just all these unique stories that just the faithfulness of him, the gospel got to them. Uh, but back to the whole putting people in positions, that to me was the example. And I think the legacy I see is you guys, you, Pastor Jim, that's his legacy is who's coming after him. And, you know, we take it for granted because we sat here the whole time. But Dr. Stringer mentioned it last week, the church going from a senior pastor to the next pastor without a blip. Yeah, I mean, yeah. the church, it was flawless. Yeah. That's unheard of. Yeah. Um, and to me, that's, that's what I remember. I was able to work... <laughs> with some of the video stuff. And I was telling Kim, one of the things I remember, and I couldn't figure out when exactly it was. It was either in the middle of the building project or before when he was going through Revelation. Okay. And he memorized yes. yeah. entire passages of Revelation. Yeah. And for some reason, as a, a teenager, I just remember, you know, you're in school and you have to memorize a verse of pace or something. And you're like, how is he doing that? How is he standing up there without, it, it was amazing to me. And I realize now as I'm older that it was all to immerse himself in the word of God and let it become real. And as a result, his teaching was that much more powerful. But I, I don't know, I just remember being blown away by that. And, and as it went on week to week, so he would memorize that text of that sermon. So whatever portion he was gonna cover that day, and so you, it would become this thing. You look around the room and everyone's like, right. exactly. he's exactly. right on, he's got it. You know, exactly. like, and, and so we're all like checking him, you know, like you would if you're a monitor in a learning center, like, yep, you got it right. But it was, it was, it was, it was powerful. And I think to your point, Pastor Dave, and I know I've said this so many other times, he taught the word of God, studied the word of God, lived out the word of God, literally as if it was the word of God and expected it to have power, expected it to change lives, expected it to make a difference, and, and it did. Um, but you sense that expectation when he taught it, that, that, that it's, it's there, it's, it's real, you know? Well, and we were, we were kind of joking even a little bit beforehand, but one thing that I think that I remember growing up, and even now, he hated distractions during the gospel. <laughs> but there's a reason. <laughs> yes. It wasn't because he period, didn't. But. Well, but he, it's not, it wasn't like he didn't want to be distracted. It was the fact that someone sitting there would be distracted by something his church member may be doing. Right. And that person may be influenced as a result of that. Yeah. And that is why uh, we were talking about every event using that. We, you know, we do the Christmas pageant and things like that. But I just, he always made it a point to include the crucifixion and then the resurrection. Mm -hmm. and, and people would often say, ah, why do you do that at Christmas? No, because it wasn't about entertainment. Right. It was about, we're going to get people here. We're going to do all we can to get people here and then give them the gospel. Yeah. And it's always been that way. Yeah. And it's, it's just amazing. Dave, do you remember? I, one of the things when I think of him and I think of the Christmas pageant, I think of him just begging people to pray <clears throat> and telling people, like, when you're in the hallway, I want you quiet and I want you praying for the gospel. And every time he would take that so seriously and being backstage, whether we're getting ready to sing or whatever, he would just be in, like, get in this zone of, oh, yeah. he, you could see, like, he had this enormous pressure Absolutely. of of giving the gospel and presenting it. And he didn't want one person to say that they were here and that they didn't understand it. Yeah. And one of the last, one of the last times that I talked to him was, and really had like a, a meaningful conversation was a year ago uh, after the Christmas pageant and uh, Pastor Jim had put me up to give the gospel as Obed, as the character or whatever. And I just remember Dr. Scudder coming up to me after that, and it didn't have to be him doing it. Mm -hmm. He was just so, 
and I can't like there was this his face was just so proud that in his church yeah. that this young person because I'm still just a kid to him that this young person is up there giving the gospel yep. and and it just meant so much to him and that's that was my last kind of memory of him he, which is he, awesome he did though he he you know um whenever he was out of town so when he was the pastor whenever he was out of town um and maybe more than more than me probably chris you probably had to leave reports too there was a reporting system <laughs> that you left reports because he wanted to know how did it go was it was it okay it was everything you know and um because again i mean this was everything this is life right and so after he you know retired well he wanted reports of just how was the service you know just a short short text had a great day today you know whatever it was and um it, it caught me off guard one of those sort of waves of emotion caught me off, off guard um, last Sunday when, and I always did it before I left my office because I knew as soon as I get in my car or I get home or you get to lunch, you're going to forget. And I never wanted him wandering or waiting, like, was everything okay, you know? But I also knew, especially for him now that he's retired, that his heart is here. He wants to know that gospel is going out. The service was good, whatever it is. And I went to leave that text. I had to catch myself. I went to leave that, you know, that text. And, but it mattered. It mattered to him and it did not matter that he was giving it. And I love that point, John, because it didn't. It was just, was it still happening? You know, was the voice still going out? Was the gospel still going out? Um, and that, that was a lot You to know, him. Pastor Paul is a parent and now a grandparent. Um, I had to get that in there. That's an important thing. Yeah, it is. Um, what would make you feel more um, excited than when your children or your grandchildren are doing exactly that? Yeah, so and true. so that's really how he looked at John and the rest of us. We were his next generation, and it was very, um, I know it, it thrills me that my children are here and my grandchildren. So yeah. think about the size of his family. That really is his legacy. It's not just... And you're right. It's his family. I mean, right. that's how he looked at it. Right. He would die for any one of us. Um, he would do anything for any one of us. Uh, it's so true. I mean, that, that, was his, that, that was what was important to him, you know, um, uh, in, in, in life. I remember when we, uh, we, we talked about this after our last broadcast, Gary and I were talking about it, and um, when we first had our basketball team, and someone along the way had explained to him that athletes, which we were not, but athletes carb loaded the night before their big event. <laughs> so now nobody made better spaghetti than Dr. Scudder. Nobody made better spaghetti. It was the best in the world. And so all the guys that were on the basketball team, I think he did it for the girls volleyball team at for that first year, the night before a game, he made spaghetti. Every time, I mean, it was that was how serious he he was into helping us win. He he cared about us getting a victory, having fun, you know, accomplishing this this goal of winning these games, and we never hardly won any. But it was it was a big deal to him, you know, that we were going to carb load, and we didn't care what the excuse was. We just got to get his spaghetti at least a week, you know, one or once or twice a week. But he would take any idea. I think of all. The way family camp used to be uh, up in northern Minnesota and the list of activities that was a mile long, looking back now, I know that came from him. I know he had people that helped out with that, but yeah. it takes someone to say, we're going to make this the best week, two weeks, three weeks, four weeks, however long some <laughs> of us were up there. Um, and he would he would just make it the best time yeah. people could ever have. And I, he was just so creative that way too. And he would inspire you. We use Romans 12, one and two so often as a dedication verse. And we use that it's logical to serve yeah. the Lord. Yeah. And it is logical as a result of what Christ has done. But then you see someone like him 
that shows that it's not just logical out of love for your Savior. It's logical because now you've seen the end result of a life that is lived yeah. that way. Yeah, so, so you look and say, it is logical. Yeah. Look at the blessings yeah. that he has had. Yeah. And, you know, I can only pray to have a few of those blessings, you know, uh, as a result of serving the Lord. It's so true. And I think, Karen, that's what meant a lot to me as a young person, watching you guys and seeing God blessing and, and, and it, it gave credibility to the message. Um, it, and he, and he never claimed it was anything but by faith, but he would always be so, uh, uh, quick to point out this is of God. This is of God. See that? That doesn't happen unless you're serving. And that helped me as a young person. And I know as as then you guys um, coming up, um, I I felt, you know, sort of that that peer pressure that, hey, you know, if it wasn't for these guys before me to live it out, to do it, and I saw their blessings, I, I have to do the same thing. I want to do the same thing. And then to get to see another generation, you know, come. Pastor Dave, you mentioned um, Dr. Scudder's creativity in assignments and job descriptions and and stuff like that. And I'm sure we could go around uh, for for all of us as to different assignments that we've had, different jobs that we've had and and things that that he would do. And um, Chris, I know that you had many, not just, you know, the secretarial thing that most, most people know here now, but finance office and coaching and, and, and all the different things. And, um, I know that, that he, um, there was a reason why he really, really wanted to be at that wedding that day. And, and you had a lot to do with that too. Um, what are your, what are some of your memories? Well, I think from what David just said about you saw his life blessed. And so why wouldn't I serve to get that same blessing? I was, I was really struck by that last week when I was just trying to absorb everything that had just happened and I was processing and I, I was looking around and I was looking at my mom and Doc and Meg and John and my kids and there isn't one part of my life that hasn't been touched so true. by him or mm-hmm. because of him, yes. um, because of his faithfulness, because of the faithfulness of his family his wife, because of Julie and Pastor Neil, because of Pastor Jim and Karen. I have everything that I have. My life would be so different if my parents hadn't chosen him to follow him and if he hadn't been where he was being faithful. Yeah. I, I wouldn't have anything that I have. Yeah. So that was, the, that was the part that struck me when I just looked around. It was every part of my life has been touched by this church and that man and Dr. Scudder yeah. because he was faithful. And I think we all feel that way. And I've talked to so many people that say, if, if, if this, if this, if this, if this, you know, there's, there's this layering of, of people that have um, been there. And you know, Pastor John, you talked about him challenging your dad, you know, um, that was a big challenge. I mean, it, it takes courage to challenge somebody like that. Um, and, and he did not lack courage. But I think what some people um, who, who didn't see him behind the scenes didn't realize is that the courage did not simply come from a personality. The courage came from the calling of what he felt God had called him to do. A real conviction. A real conviction right. because I saw him after he would challenge someone like that when nobody else was looking and he's doubting himself. He's wondering if he's totally lost his mind <laughs> and will he ever even have a church again if he walks back out on the stage Sunday. I mean, those were not, you know, um, just comments throwing out. He had plenty of moments where it was like, oh my goodness, have I challenged people too far? I'll never forget when we were building this building and we were standing out um, kind of where the handicapped parking area is. And it was after a Saturday work day. And you guys all know what Saturday work days were. Um, and um, he was so proud of you girls, Kim and Chris, for the drive it and running the fork trucks and all that. He, ta- he told people that story 
till till who knows when. I mean, he he was so proud of you guys. But one Saturday, um, you know, we all know it was hard. It was hard. People were working long hours. They're coming here on Saturdays and volunteering their time. And so he was having one of those moments where he was like, "Paul, am I am I pushing too hard? Am, am I gonna am I gonna literally drive this church into the ground?" And um, this was one of those moments where you say it carefully. But I heard in my mind, as he said that, I heard in my mind something that he had said. And I just simply repeated it back to him. And I said, Pastor, you know how you would always say, when we get to heaven, we will never say, oh, we just did a little too much. You know how he would say that. And so I wanted to encourage him that, hey, we're okay. But on the other hand, I felt like, isn't it more fun to be a part of a ministry that the risk is we're too dedicated, we're going too hard, you know, <laughs> because that was how he was. And I think that that's a godly biblical approach. But he still, even with all the confidence in challenging someone or pushing hard, he was human in a sense that he would say, boy, was that too much? You know, you know I have to add to that as a mom, and I, I did tell him this. Um, I always want to make sure um, that you say things when you can to people rather than after they're gone home. And I said to him, that building project, I really credit it with um, taking Kristen to a whole different level of ownership of this church. Yeah. And I'm sure it applied to Kim yeah. also. Yeah. You can't, first of all, at that age group, young teenagers, um, and they worked hard. They did. Um, oh, yeah. They worked under wonderful people like John Legler, who really taught them how to work, and Mark Thomas, who taught them how to have fun while they yeah. were working. How to laugh. Right? <laughs> right? But there wasn't time for anything other than building this church. Yeah, and I true. actually credit her dedication and her ownership of this ministry um, with those beginning days. So, did he work them too hard? Absolutely not. Yeah. Absolutely not. So if we could get another one lined up for when know, my Kristen, kids are about I, that I, age. I knew that she was impacted, Karen, because she keeps telling me, when's the next building project? I have a teenage daughter. I need her operating a fork truck. Uh, but it, I agree with you. It, 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 it impacted all of us. And, and yet, it, it just there's so many people that would have never known that when all the people went home at the end of a work night, you know, he's looking in the mirror saying, please, dear Lord, give me wisdom because I, I, I you know, we got to do this because he cared about the people, right. you know, and, um, but it did impact you guys. It, it impacted you. It impacted everybody to, to do it together, to go through it together. Um, and um, <laughs> speaking of comments at the right time. I just had a funny thought, Karen. There was a, was it a pageant one time? We were in your office, Chris, and um, um, it was something about uh, meeting our goal or meeting our number, right? And Karen, this is a great moment. And, and, and he was, we weren't hitting a mark. We weren't hitting something. And Karen with a straight face says, it's easy, Dr. Scudder, it's easy. You just have to lower your expectations <laughs> and then it won't be disappointing. <laughs> I'm like, why didn't I ever think of that? <laughs> and I think he said something like, well, you could do that. <laughs> he never would, but, uh, but you know, and you were talking about the Christmas pageant and, and how he would take on that, that pressure. And I see it hit Pastor Scudder Jr. as well. When that time comes, it's actually about a day or two before you can just see it building the pressure of giving the gospel to all those people. But when we first started doing Christmas pageants in this building. It's a huge room. Obviously, you don't want empty seats, right? But we didn't have tickets. It was just come to our right. Christmas pageant. And I remember standing out front with him by the glass doors, watching every car that went by on Quentin Road, pleading with God that it would turn in because we had no idea who was going to show up, you know? And, um, and then, of course, we finally wised up and said, oh, why don't we do tickets, you know? <laughs> so and Kristen you helped us. Stand by those kind of, doors. As long as I can remember, he would stand by those doors yeah. watching the people come and praying, in. praying, David. Yep. Not, not, 
it, and it wasn't just to have a full room, like we've already said, you know, many times. But no, it was him bearing that burden yeah. of there's somebody that might hear the gospel for the very first time. Yeah. It was, yeah, it, it was just unbelievable. It it was in every aspect of ministry. So evangelism after they were saved, like you said, we're going to be real, challenging your dad like that. You know, um, I remember being in his office for probably one of my first meetings with him where he challenged somebody and I'm sitting there with like not blinking for an hour <laughs> and, and, and we end the meeting and it's just now me and him in his office and he turns to me and he says, this is how you make your best friends and your worst enemies because you challenge them with truth, you deal with love and he always did. He was always so gracious, um, but he was gonna challenge you with truth. And he knew that that was the key to you being successful, to you being blessed of God. And he knew if you took it, you would see that it was worth doing it, as your dad would say that now. And then we've seen some that, you know, that didn't. Um, so I have a note in my Bible that I came across the other day um, from one of his messages. And I think it was around um, 06, 04, I, I don't remember. And I won't get the title of the message right, but it was something like, um, and he, he always had the greatest sermon titles <laughs> that he would come up with. And you know how within the, the wedding vows, it's to have and to hold. And so his sermon title that Sunday was something like, uh, having isn't holding or something like that. And I wrote a note in my Bible where he had said, remember out of all the children of Israel, only two had faith that then went in. All the others had the same truth. All the others had the same opportunity. All the others had the same God, same pillar of fire, same parting of the Red Sea. Only two went in. And so his whole point of that message was there's a big difference between having truth, being saved, and actually really holding to it and allowing it to affect your life in that way. And, um, and that was, again, back to that, we're going to be a real church. You know, we're going to be a real church. So, Kim, you, you were on that fork truck operating yeah. crew and that he was very proud of. And um, I can picture you and Chris, like to this day, barely being able to reach those pedals um, and, and learning how to operate the, the fork trucks and on the drive it crew and, and, and doing all that. What are, your, what are some of your memories? I think, I think that when I look back at all of this, that he taught us that serving God was so much fun. Yeah. We, everything we did was so much fun. You were going to build a building. It's like, yeah, let's do it. Right. <laughs> you get to drive a fork. You're like, we get to do this. And you're going to work all day, all summer. It's like, yeah, let's do this. And everything we did was so much fun. And we yeah. tell the high schoolers, work hard, play hard. And I think he taught us that through all of you and through him. He's like, you're going to work hard and then you're going to get to enjoy it all. And yeah. I, I love that. Um, we, he, I remember him telling me, you get to go work at camp for the summer. And I was like, oh, this is going to be so much fun. And like, we're going to serve God and we're going to do it. And like, if you're going to do it, do it. Don't yeah. just like kind of do it. So yeah. I remember that and he instilled that in us and we're trying to instill it in our kids. And I think as we tell our kids, like, you're going to serve God. It's so much fun. And all the realities of it, it's because that's how we've been taught. My parents did. He taught my parents. My parents yeah. taught us. Yep. And um, those are my favorite memories, I think, is serving God is so much fun. And you guys knew how to have fun. Like he, he, he knew how to make sure kids had fun. Yes. But, but then you guys especially were just like all in. Like all in, let's, let's, you know, let's go do it. We're going to, we're going to lay on the ground in the narrows, staring at the stars <laughs> right. and it's going to be right. better than anything you've ever done in your life. It's you like, know? Oh, stars. And it was awesome. Like, oh, it it yeah. was awesome. <laughs> um, he, he had such a gift of um, really knowing how young people thought, how, how, how you tick. I mean, he, he did, he, he knew and there were times where he'd be like, is that really going to be fun or is that really going to be cool or whatever? And then it ends up, it's like, yeah, we just walked through a swamp, you know, for two hours and it was a blast. And, 
or whatever. There's a million things that you can think of all the crazy things that we would do, you know, up at camp or whatever. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe it was a special meal. You know, everything both of you have coached. Everything was always a big deal. I feel like everything was always a big deal. It was, we never just like did something. We did something. <laughs> yeah. That's what I always felt like. I think that's why I always loved it. Yeah. Everything we did. He... Well, and being a, <laughs> being a parent now, you realize that he meant it because that took real money from a church. I mean, it was still fairly established, but what they did for us yes. up at Spring Labs and family camps, it's like somebody had to pay for that gas. <laughs> somebody had to, I mean, it, it took his flock to make that happen. And that's a result of a leader that has inspired them to say this generation's worth it. So yeah, yeah. that's amazing. Us. Yeah. It was not a, um, it was not a put on, it was not an act. I mean, he felt like whether or not we served the Lord was his whole life dependent on it. You know, that, that like, where you at Paul, you know, where yeah. you at? And, um, and talk about being, being called in or being rebuked or, you know, um, again, same thing. He, he wouldn't hesitate. He was very gracious about it, but he would tell you if you were wrong, you know, he, he would, he would tell you. And as a young person, you know, you knew that he was going to be fair. He wanted truth and he was going to be real. So he never had some sort of expectation that you're going to be this perfect, you know, kid. Um, how many times would he say, especially in his parenting, um, seminars and, and stuff like that that we all love and remember, um, he would say, like, don't try to catch your kids. Don't, don't try to catch your kids. Like, they'll catch themselves, you know? And then he would say, yeah, what, what you don't, you know, inspect, don't expect, but don't try to catch them. Like, let them live life. Let them have fun. One of the parenting moments that I'll never forget, I, and I was just, we were in India, this was 2002, I think, um, and I was for some reason in the hotel room with you and Dodger Scudder, and I don't know why I was in there, but maybe he just wanted me in there. But you were he dealing loved to talk. with he did, he loved and to talk. what I was gonna, with young people, like he had the this ability to look at you and to te he was always teaching, mm -hmm. which is such a good lesson for us. You know, at, we we have kids now, and I find myself always like. All right, kids. Now this is why we do this. Right. You know, like, <laughs> which is, it's just, I think, what we all should be doing. But he led by example, and he looked at me. He said, he, "You guys were dealing with something in the church. Something had happened uh, with a parent, a kid, whatever. Something went wrong." And he he looked at me. He said, "All right, John. You want? I want you to listen to me. Parenting is not hard. Just remember this. Parenting is not hard. All you have to do is you love your kids." Love them like there's nothing, nothing else to do in the world. But then you also have to discipline your kids. But then you make sure that you love them after you discipline them. He's like, that's it. It's the simplest thing in the world. And people still mess it up. <laughs> he's, like, <laughs> he's like, this is the easiest thing in the world. Now I, I can kind of guess what we must have been talking I about before now, you came in. <laughs> I could, I'll never forget that. And it, like, I was just kind of shaking my head. As I'm in my late 30s now, and t teach, helping to teach a, a parenting class, and I'm telling that story about Dr. Scudder talking to me, yeah. and it's just the impact that a single person can have, yeah. and what I, I just I want to encourage like everybody that's watching, young people, people that are new to the church, they don't even know who Dr. Scudder is. I mean, they know his name, yeah, yeah. But I just talked oh, to somebody right. who's newer to the church. They just read Finish Strong. Like, I feel like I kind of know the man a little bit more. Yeah. But Dr. Scudder was a man who was, who was faithful, just like Kristen said. He, and, and so people that are new to the church, young people, you can do amazing things for God yeah. just like this man did. Yeah. If you're just willing to do what, and that's all Dr. Scudder did, yeah. is he was just day in, day out, he did what God called him to do. Yeah. And that's what we can do. Totally. If we would just follow the, follow the lead. And I think that's his legacy and that's what he wants us to do, obviously. And he would say that all the time. Um, he would say, and my dad both, they would both say, 
you know, Paul or Jimmy, you know, you you better do better than I do. You you better accomplish more than I do. You know, they 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 their challenge to all of us and to all of you was progress further, grow in Christ more, like impact more people, you know? Um, and, and I loved that. And you, you were talking about the, um, um, you know, the, the graciousness too of, of the, you know, the rebuke or whatever, and then like forgive and, and move on, you know? And I'll never forget one time, um, something happened. I don't even know what it was, but I got called in his office and this was like as a, as a young adult, and it was pretty tense. It was pretty tense of what the subject line was. And it got cleared up. It was all like done and set. And I'm like sweating, you know, and I'm about to pass out, you know. And he's like, all right, well, let's move on. You want to go to lunch? <laughs> and I'm like, sure, let's go to lunch. I don't know if I'll eat much, but let's do but that. That would blow your mind as a young person or even... <laughs> Fortunately, in my case, he's in as an adult and things like that. But he would talk to you, and it was exactly that. He would deal with what needed to be dealt with, and then, dink, okay, I'm moving on. Now you need to. Yeah, let's go. Like, this has been dealt keep, with. Keep moving. I expect results, and here we go. Yeah. And that's an example, though, of someone that it's not, it, it's not spite. It's not frustration. This is, God's put me in this position. I'm going to deal with it. And then let's move on. Yeah. And it's an example. Well, he made it so simple. He preached the word of God. Yeah. And expected you to live it. Yeah. And it's, it is really that simple. You listen to it and then you turn around and do it. Don't hem and haw about it. Don't think about it. You just do it. Yeah. And it, 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 it is that simple. It really is. And he would say that a lot. Like the Christian life is not that hard. Yeah. You know, the Christian life is not that hard and or parenting or, or whatever it was. There were two things that he would say 90% of spirituality, right, is flexibility and flexibility. sleep, right? He, yeah. he, would, he would say, or maybe one was 90 and one was 99%. I forget what they were, but he would always say that, that flexibility is, you know, 90% of... I remember him over, I don't know, just stuck in my mind as a young person, like... If, if you're offended, you need to get over it. Right. <laughs> it's like, if you're walking down the hallway and somebody looks at you weird, like, they're not looking at you weird. Right. They just, you know, ate something bad for breakfast or something. <laughs> it's like, we need to just get united. And his, his heartbeat was, you, everybody get behind the common purpose. Yeah. Let's, if we all work together and be united for for getting something done for the Lord. I mean, what could we accomplish? Yeah. And that was always his vision. And he just gets so frustrated with people that would get upset about these silly little things. things. Yeah. yeah, yeah. The, in, in the grant, and especially him, he had this huge picture in mind, yeah. but everybody else has these, these little views. And I, as, as I got older, he was good at communicating that and getting us to see the big picture. Yeah. And I'm grateful for that, for sure. I just remember, <laughs> you know, if that rubs you the wrong way, turn the cat around. <laughs> <laughs> there, there's all these oh, phrases uh, that yeah. when you look back now, it's just like, it's th it is simple. Yeah. <laughs> you fix it. I'm just <laughs> preaching the word of God. <laughs> and a lot of times when he would address stuff like that, he, sometimes it was pure, just like, get over it. But there were a lot of times where he would say, look, you might even have a valid worry, concern, or gripe. But in spite of that, look at what is at stake and set it aside. And to me, that's, that's reality. So, because there are things, there are things that just, whatever, turn you off or offend you or this or that or the other. And that is real life. We're all human. And he was so good at saying, you know, sometimes just get over it. But other times it was like, yeah. That could be valid, so we can all sit here and talk about it for hours, or we can say, for the sake of the cause of Christ, move on. And again, keeping that, that big picture. You How know? important is it to stay the course? Yeah. Isn't that really what you were saying? Yeah. Um, some people get offended. Um, I'm, it's pretty hard to offend me, so I'm, I'm okay with that. But just stay the course and look around and see the results of people who have stayed 
the course. Look at the blessings in their life. Look at the blessings in his life. Look at his family. Look at his church family. Just stay the course. And Just stay honestly, in the ship. It's, that is the biblical principle. You know, there, there's a reason why Hebrews 11 talks about all these people and we know their flaws. They stayed faithful. Because the God that their faith was attached to was way greater than the people themselves. And that's what he lived out. That's what he taught. That's what he, you know, um, how he envisioned ministry. I love when we were with Gary and Terry the other night. um, Gary said that Dr. Scudder could see the people in the seats before they got there, you know. And seeing people in the seats, hearing the gospel, was what drove him. And so petty problems, you know, rebellious teenagers or whatever there that came along the way, we deal with it and we move on because there's people that need to hear the gospel. Let's go. And, um, and his son is the exact same way. And what a blessing we have to now go forward with his son as our pastor right. with the exact same mindset, um, gifted, talented, but the passion is just as great for all of those same, you know, priorities. And um, I, I love for, for, this is purely selfish on my part, but for my kids, um, they have kind of had Dr. Scudder as their pastor for a little bit and now um, his son. And they love them both, you know, dearly and appreciate both dearly. But it's, it's a, it's a blessing. It, to me, it's a special, special blessing to have something like that in a church. Um, we've, I think, gotten used to it. But as you heard from Dr. Stringer the other night and many others who come, like at the Grace Conference, it's not the norm. No. You know, it's not the norm. It's a very, very special thing. Well, and we're seeing his son do what he did. Yeah. That's, that's the greatest. It's awesome. One of, the, one of the awesome memories that I have of Dr. Scudder is being up at camp. Um, and being in those long meetings, the dedication meetings, and then he would stand up at the front and he would just beg people to come forward and give their lives to Christ. And we'd walk back into the kitchen and you have all those pots and pans and things hanging down and everybody would be crowded back there and he would just walk in there and he would be so proud of young people or adults or whoever it was making that decision to serve the Lord. And I remember being, you know, 9, 10, 11, 12, early teens and, and making that decision and, and feeling that just joy. And, uh, and then what's awesome is now, now I'm older and now to see Pastor Scudder having those same meetings mm-hmm. and having that same joy with the next generation of young people who are saying that, yes, I want to live my life yeah. for forever. And oh, I just, being in heaven when, when he got there had to be pretty cool. Oh, <laughs> I, 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 picture, I picture him seeing Bob. I picture, you know, he, he, he probably had some sort of gymnasium built or whatever. <laughs> Art, Art, Rohrheim, Art Rohrheim talked to Bob and said, we need an Awana circle, <laughs> you know. <laughs> and I mean, you just know it, 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 it had to be something. I don't know about you guys. It, it, it just, there's something about knowing about Dr. Scudder walking into heaven that just makes eternity that much more real to me here. It, it, and maybe that's very unspiritual to say, I don't know. Um, it just feels like with that guy there, you know, we're, 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 we're right there. We're all right there on that edge to say, what are we doing for Christ? Look in the mirror, challenge ourselves to, to serve and, and, and be faithful. Um, and I also love the fact that nobody can hurt him again. Yeah. Nobody can touch him. Nobody can doubt any of his desires or uh, criticize his motives or anything like that. Um, and um, he's, he's, you know, with the Savior. What a they blessing. They can, but then look at the fruit of his ministry. Look at his kids. Look yeah. at his grandkids. Yeah. Look at his great-grandkids. I mean, totally. look at the job you're doing, the job his son is doing. And you can't. You can't complain about that. No. So record the record is set. Someone, I think it was your dad, Mr. Rendy, um, had had been talking to my dad about the idea of 
why is it that the bema seat for Christians is not right away? So why don't you get your rewards or, you know, wood, hay, stubble, gold, silver, precious stone? Why doesn't that happen right when you walk in? And so uh, my dad's answer to that was, and I love this, especially in light of Dr. Scudder, the record's not done yet. Mm. All of the impact mm. that he has had still goes on. Amen. The wood, hay, and the stubble the, the, uh, is, is uh, in the gold, silver, precious stone. It's, it's still going on till, till the end of the earth's time, right? There's no settling the record. And I love that because it's so true. It's still going on to all of our kids and our kids' kids and so many other people. Think of all those souls that are credited to his account yeah. because of that. Yeah. Um, I, this is probably not biblical, um, but I just envision him walking into heaven and everybody applauding and greeting and high-fiving and <laughs> hugging and the joy, the yeah. joy when he finally got yeah. home. Yeah. And that's what I have just, it has brought the biggest smiles to my face throughout this, even though there's been plenty of tears, is that just knowing we've all described it here together, knowing the level of, of dedication that he had to, to, to be real, to make it count, to win souls, right? And to see that faith become sight, to see it become a reality for him. I just, uh, I'm hoping it was recorded and we get to see <laughs> when we get there, what, what that moment was like. Um, and then as all of you have, have expressed, um, I think there's so many of us that just feel so grateful uh, for the impact. And then my next emotion is, is a conviction and a conviction to say, I have to do more. I have to do more. Um, and, and how many more people can, can, can I impact? And it's not to say, um, you know, I, I need to do this or do that particular thing. It might be, but it's more the, the, the level of faithfulness with regards to people. It, it, that was him. And I think that's the biblical approach. Do you give people enough love as Christ would do? You know, how many times do we hear him say, the value of the soul, right? The value of the soul. Mm -hmm. And I never ever heard that from any other pastor. I never read that in any other commentary. The value of the soul is literally the same value as Jesus Christ mm -hmm. because he sent his son to, and he would do it for one soul that would trust Christ. And um, so thank you guys. This has been enjoyable and um, I appreciate you sharing. And I, and I know this, I know that uh, he is, he loves all of you. He's proud of all of you and he's cheering us on. Your mom, Kim said, he's joined the great cloud of witnesses yeah. that is cheering us on. Mm -hmm. And uh, what a great day that will be when we all get together in heaven. Well, we've had a great time together tonight sharing memories and just thinking about all those experiences that we had and, and so much fun and, and so many great things that God has done through this church and that God is going to continue to do through this church. We mentioned tonight too that we're so blessed here at Quentin Road that Dr. Scudder trained up his son and um, poured into him and invested into him and in training him to take over our church. And not only has it gone on uh, flawlessly after he retired, but it has grown and God has blessed. And we're grateful for our pastor. And I know we're looking forward to having him back preaching here uh, this coming Sunday morning. But I wanna share with you, if you've never trusted Christ as your savior, I wanna share with you the gospel message, which is good news. I wanna let this wallet represent sin and let this hand represent me and you. We all have sin. And it's that sin that separates us from God, which is a perfect and a holy God. And the Bible says that sin is that separation. So therefore sin is what's going to keep us from heaven if we remain in that state of having sin. But then the Bible says that God loved the world so much that he sent his only begotten son. Let this hand represent Jesus Christ. God loved us so much that he sent his son to take away that sin. And it's a very personal message because he offers that as a gift to every sinner of every generation of all human history. God sent his son, Jesus, who knew no sin, to be made 
sin for us so that we could have the righteousness of God? Have you put your personal trust, faith, reliance in what Christ did for you? If you haven't, I plead with you to do that tonight. It's as simple as saying to the Lord something like this, I know I'm a sinner and I'm accepting your gift of salvation, paying for my sins, and it's all him and none of you. Dr. Scudder used to say, I can't even lift my little finger to save myself. That's what trust is all about. And I hope that you'll do that tonight if you have not. Quentin Road family, we love you. We care for you. I wish we could be together. And someday, hopefully soon, we will be able to be together. But let me remind you, we're available. We're here if you need us. Call the church number, and if you need something, we're there. Uh, If you want to talk with someone, pray with someone, please don't hesitate to call, and we want to be there to help you. And in the meantime, the ministry is still going on. We're going out around the world through live stream, through TBN, television, through radio stations. So pray that during this time, the gospel will go out and that many will be saved. God bless and have a great night.